Hey everybody, it's Tommy Ashley with the Inside Carolina Podcast. On Wednesday, you heard from Ross Martin, Buck Sanders, and Jay Bateman, and then the Inside Carolina crew broke that all down for you. Today, OC Phil Longo's on the hot seat as Ross and Buck talk to the third-year coordinator about his expectations and what to look for from his offense and Sam Howell heading into spring ball. After that, Buck, Jason Staples, Greg Barnes, and myself get together to break it all down in the Inside Carolina Roundtable. So enjoy the interview, enjoy the roundtable, and get ready for Carolina football to kick off spring practice later this month. And now we're going to bring on UNC Offensive Coordinator Phil Longo. Before we get into that interview, I want to remind you to rate, review, and subscribe to the Inside Carolina Podcast. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com, right on Franklin Street and online at JohnnyT-Shirt.com. And all Inside Carolina subscribers can use the premium message boards to get the code to get 10% off. And here is Coach Phil Longo. Buck? Coach, i uh you know, Ross and I divvied up the questions and he, he punted to me the question to talk about Sam Howell. Is he any good as a quarterback? <laughs> you know, and I think um, I'm excited to watch him play this year, Buck, because uh, when you have a kid that works on things the way he does mentally and then works on things the way he does with Coach Hess and his program, and who cares so much, all they do is get better. So that means his third year should be the, the best of the three. And so I'm probably as excited as the two of you are about watching him in his third third campaign. You answered that question better than I asked it. I mean, so one thing, Coach, I mean, where can you get better? What are you working on? I mean, I remember last season was maybe getting a little leaner, working on some running, obviously decision-making, um, super productive in his two years. Where can he get better in year three? So he and I just sat down and talked about that stuff. I think uh, there are some throws um, to his left. So if you're talking about specific things, when we talked about the arm town aspect, there's some throws that we want to get out a little bit earlier to the left. We're going to work on those things. Um, we want to be a little cleaner in the pocket with our footwork. Um, I think as the season went on, we got a little bit busier in terms of movement in the pocket. So we're going to work on cleaning that up a little bit. Uh, I think the focus for him athletically is always to continue to uh, improve his hip flexibility so it improves his overall mobility. And then, you know, we're, we're still we're, – we're deep into the NFL study right now because they do some things at that level that present some issues and force Sam or anybody that we're studying that stuff with at quarterback to think a little bit more um, with regards to attack and scheme. You know, because anytime you do something more difficult and then we – come back to an ACC game and we see something that difficult, we're ready for it. And if we don't see something that difficult, then it's really easier. And that, that is really what helps slow the game down for a quarterback mentally. You know, and I don't, I don't know if everybody understands what that means all the time, but slowing it down means it just really happens at, at a point where he can understand it and it can translate into his execution. And so those are probably the four areas that we're focused on the most. And briefly, I know Buck wants to get into running backs, but what does the NFL tape breakdown look like? How does that happen? Can you kind of bring us into that room when you're going over NFL tape with him? We, have, we break down all the coverages. And so every single uh, cover one, which is the most prominent coverage in the NFL, it's like 2,973 reps, whatever it is. So it's every cover one that all the team. And what we do is we go in and we might break down the top four or 500 most difficult cover one presentations from the season. And then we study those and, you know, talk about, hey, if we called uh, our four verticals here, how would we handle it? If we call four verticals, if we called mesh here, how would we handle it? And then you go to the next most prevalent coverage, cover three. We watch all 32 teams in, in the next most prevalent coverage. We go through all the coverages. And then when that's done, and that's what we're in the middle of doing now. So this summer, what we'll do is we'll, we'll graduate from that and we'll look at the Tennessee Titans and we will – go through their games and we'll call our offense against everything that the Tennessee Titans do. Okay. So first it's study all the coverages. And then after that, let's do it by defense or by team and let's attack each of the NFL defenses with our system on offense. Coach, I wanted to talk about running backs. Uh, you were obviously blessed to have Michael Carter and Javante Williams over the last couple of years. Uh, you picked up Ty Chandler at, through the transfer portal. 
How are you feeling about that room headed into spring? You know, it's interesting. We've been watching them work out with Hess and, and his staff. Um, and then we're, now we're starting to get into some of our, our walkthrough work. And it's, it's an incredibly, uh, it's much younger room, obviously, this year. You know, and uh, Javante and Michael brought explosive talent, and they also brought leadership to that room and to the team. So those are huge shoes to fill. Now, bringing Ty Chandler in gives us a veteran. So he's, he's done it in SEC games, so he's been there. Um, and that gives us a little bit of a, you know, some maturity and some leadership in that room and, and some experience. And then you have a lot of young guys that I think all benefited from watching what it's like to be an elite running back in this offense. You know, they got to watch Javante and Michael come to work every day, as they say, with the lunchbox and, and get after it. And, and, you know, Michael was a, a, a not a rah-rah guy, but he was a vocal leader. And then he went to work. Javante didn't say a word. He just led by example. And then he went to work. So they've seen it. They've seen it done two different ways. All of them in that running back room have different personalities. And I will say, though, British Brooks brings back a work ethic and a little bit of leadership in that room that, that uh, we're glad to have. And I, and I love that home room, and it's a very talented room, and it's going to be fun to watch. It kind of feels like, Buck, two springs ago when we were watching a bunch of young, inexperienced receivers go attack the positions and learn the offense. And so now we're going to be doing that with the running back room. And on the running backs, um, you talk about DJ Jones. People are excited about him. He's come back from an injury, should be ready for spring. And Caleb Hood, the freshman who's 230 pounds, um, what do you like about those two guys? And, and do you think Hood could, could be a, a big-time factor in this season? I know you haven't seen him play yet. but Who else did you say? DJ Jones it seems like another guy that, that could have a chance this year to, to be an impact player. I'm excited about a lot of them. Like you have, uh, we just talked about Bruce. You have DJ coming back off of his foot surgery. He ran around today and looked really good. And, you know, uh, DJ probably reminds me the most of uh, – reminds us really the most of uh, – he's probably the closest thing to Michael Carter, mm -hmm. you know, um, he can catch the football. He can he can slash. He can run inside. He can run outside. He's he's physical. He's got speed. So he's probably um, the closest thing to Michael Carter that we have. Ty Chandler is a tweener. He just I think he's a uh, he's right in the middle between a Javante and a Michael in terms of what he can bring to us. And then you know Caleb Hood ran around today. He's two hundred thirty four pounds right now. Yeah. You know what we got to do is we got to find the weight where he is the most effective. That might be 225. It might be 234. You just don't know until you get him out there. But the fact that he has played quarterback gives him a greater understanding of probably the defensive side of the ball, which is always a plus. Um, and then he catches the ball well because the guys that play Q are handling it every play. You know, and so he catches the ball well out there and he runs really well for his size. So that's another one. It's going to be interesting to see what he looks like when you put the pads on. And what we've heard is that Hood runs a 4-4. I don't know if he's doing that at 234 or not. But is, is he still a mentally and in terms of his uh, approach to the game, is he still more of a quarterback or a running back? Or is he – how far is he into that transition? So he was out there with the running back today, and I would tell you um, – from every conversation I've ever had with Caleb through all of recruiting and since he's been here, he, he is, uh, you know, he's a lot like Michael and Javante in that he'll do anything he can do to help the football. So, you know, if we had asked him to play safety, probably play safety. If we asked him to play tight end, he'd probably play tight end. If we asked him to be a, a running quarterback, he'd probably, he'd probably do that. I think, you know, he's at running back because both sides feel like he can really excel at that position. And I think that's how he sees himself right now. And, um, you know, it's it's a it's a credit to him that he's so diverse with regards to what what he can bring for our team. But I think where he is right now is is going to be uh, a, a real good placement for him. Moving to uh, the pass catchers, wide receivers, tight ends, I and mean, I think that the big name that everyone's excited about is Josh Downs. Had a huge um, Orange Bowl performance. What makes Josh Downs special? Because we haven't seen him too much, but what we have seen has been pretty impressive. Well, you know the. the the thing that Josh brings is, uh, you know, dad was a coach. Dad coaches right now in college football. And, and he got good coaching in high school. So, jo and Josh is a very bright kid and an ultra competitive kid. So, what you, I, I think talent wise, 
Um, he's very similar to Dez, the kid that we just lost, and he's playing the same position. So you'd like to think that we can transition him into Daz's role at that slot spot because Daz was a huge weapon there. And I think you got a, a view of it. You got a little insight in, in the bowl game with regards to what Josh is capable of. And then the fact that he comes from such polished coaching, both from his high school and from his dad, and that he's so intelligent with the game. He's already up here looking at coverages. And, and, and you know, we met the other day about just his position and how it, it, it relates to the team and what his role can be. I, I think he's going to be a really, really good one. I'm excited that we'll have him for four. The worst thing about Daz Newsom was I didn't get to coach him for four years. You know, Coach Galloway had him for two. I, I can't imagine what it would be like if he had him for four. So he, we get Josh for his whole career. And, and I think the sky's the limit for that kid. Coach, how important was it uh, for you to get uh, Bo Corrales and Garrett Walston back in terms of adding in some experience with guys that are, aren't as proven uh, and hadn't had as many snaps as those guys? I, I think the uh, only unfortunate issue for Bo was he just couldn't. You know, he had one of his best games at Florida State, which was his last game that he really played started and played. I know he came back and tried to play a little bit later in the season, but um, he, he is like on the cusp of just being another guy now, you know, and I think uh, we fully expect him to be, you know, one of the starting wide receivers this year. And then the other thing he brings to us, Buck, is uh, some tremendous leadership. ability. You know, so he is mature. He's much different than he was when I first got here. He's grown into a leadership role. Um, the guys like him, his work ethic is – that much better. And I think he's going to be one of the stalwarts at the wideout position that we just have to be patient and get him healthy. We bring him back at hundred percent and be smart with it. And with Garrett Walston, Garrett Walston is, uh, go ahead, bros. Yeah, I mean, how do you expect to maybe use him a little more in the offense as a pass catcher? In what ways can you do that within your offensive scheme? Cause I, I know y'all are pretty excited to have him back and he did show that he is a, a pretty, pretty darn good wide um, tight end. Well, if not the best, at least one of the best hands on the football. You know, and and what I'm excited about the most is Garrett did a great job of kind of closing the gap on where he'd like to be. There was tremendous improvement from Garrett two years ago to Garrett last season. So I think the thing that I'm most excited about is um, if he can make that same improvement from this past season until, you know, through to the 21 season, then he'll be that much better going into his last campaign. And so I think throwing him the football is uh, – he'll be a bigger factor this year. Um, we're going to need him to be. And I think he's only going to get bigger and stronger. So I think he'll be even better in the box when he has to perform on that aspect of the offense. So, yeah, and, and then Kamari is coming along. You know, Kamari's trying to compete with him. Mm -hmm. And then we've got some young guys in the room that all have shown flashes and have some potential. So I think we feel good about that room and with Coach Lily Manning – Manning that position, we're going to be just fine. And finally, on wide receivers, I mean, obviously you lose a lot of production with with Daz and Dami uh, entering the draft. We know some names: Coffrey Brown, Emory Simmons. You mentioned Bo. Are there any other guys that you know we should know that are going to step up? I know some guys are pretty interested in Antoine Green, who came in as a pretty highly rated recruit. Um, there's some young guys we haven't really even seen yet: uh, Gosnell, Tylee Craft, some of the freshmen. What do you think about guys that can kind of play more of a backup reserve role this year? So when you, when you get to a point where you want to compete and win every year, um, and we just talked about this today, Coach Brown and Billy High both brought up um, walking around during our workouts and our walkthrough, and, you know, you start looking at every position, and there's, there's a higher number of guys at every position that kind of look the part. You know, they just have to go execute. Now, but, and I think that lends to the depth that we're now establishing because we're putting – back-to-back -back recruiting classes together, we're starting to add more elite depth at every position. So Tylee Craft and Antoine Green and Justin Olson, you know, those guys are guys that, and, you know, you're adding to the wide out. And then we've got JJ running around out there and you've got uh, Kobe Paceauer out there running around and, and uh, Gavin Blackwell. So you're seeing more upside and more potential explosive talent at every position and who's going to play and how much they're going to play. I have no idea, nor do I care truly, 
because they're all good kids. All, all I care, I, what I'm happy about is that there's enough talent in that room that we can just reload and keep going as opposed to wondering and hoping if we have enough talent in any of the rooms to, to continue to do what we've done in the past. Paul, you want to go on offensive line? Well, I think the main thing to talk about there is you got everybody back. Um, and, but the, probably the thing that most people are curious about is depth. Who, who do you have behind those really six guys that played a lot last year? Um, that may be coming along this spring. You think maybe guys that can, um, uh, push in on the depth chart, uh, on the offensive line. So this is the first year that I think we can legitimately have eight or nine guys going in every Saturday that we can play because we really have seven. You know, you have the starting five and you add in uh, Q Johnson and you add in Ed Montillas. That's seven guys right now that you know, we feel really, really good about. All of them have their little aspects or their little things that we want to improve on, you know, and, uh, you know, we had a veteran make a mistake today that, is unlike him, you know, you just, you got to polish those things and keep getting better. But we have seven right now that we feel very comfortable about. And then, you know, you'd hope that William Barnes would make a move this year and become an eighth guy. Um, and then, you know, we have some young guys, you know, it, this is, you got guys like Caden Baker and his whole clan that are coming back now that you, you, you know, you want to, you want to see them develop. And one of them will rise to, to a certain point that maybe they can be a ninth guy. And then you have really young guys like Diego Pounds out there running around doing some things that you have no idea. All of this, of course, will change as soon as we put the pads on. But I think there's enough depth in the room now and enough um, ability that they're showing enough improvement that I'll be surprised come September when we go to the opening game against Virginia Tech if there aren't nine names that I'm bringing up to you that can play on the offensive line because of all the returning veterans and the work that Cyril's is doing in that room. How special is, um, sorry, uh, Joshua Zudu as an offensive lineman? Yeah, you know, I, I think he's really special. I think, I think you're going to see Joshua Zudu playing at the next level. Um, you know, with O-lineman, progress is always slower. And, but, but he is, uh, I think he's a very good pass protector. I think he's a very good run blocker. I think uh, one of the things that excites me is, what excites me about Garrett Walston is the ability to show tremendous improvement from one season to the next, mm -hmm. you know, both on the field and off the field, just studying the game and working out on the, on the field physically. And I, I think he has a chance to be pretty special. So I'm excited to watch him this year. All right. That's about all the time we have, Phil. I really appreciate your time. I got one final question to, to, to take you out. Yes, I was sir. wondering if you could give us a definition of, in your mind of what a football guy is. Football guy. Yeah. Coach. What? Coach or a player? A, a you player. said, I think what Ross was referring to is you mentioned uh, Bo Corrales as somebody who's going to be a guy. <laughs> uh, I think that's what Ross was referring to. I, I, I'm guessing you're meaning uh, a dude or, you know, like that in that line of uh, speech. However you want to take it. I, I, I'm going to, well, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna... to. I'm going to say you're talking about players. So a guy for me is a dude. A guy for me is a, <laughs> a is, dude. We want, we want him out there on every down until he needs a rest. You know, De'Ami Brown was going to stay out there until we needed a rest. And I think Bo is approaching. If we can get him healthy and he's 100%, I think, you know, he, he showed in the Florida State game what he's capable of doing when uh, he's healthy and he's focused and he's playing really good football. And so – Hopefully we have a bunch of dudes, Buck. I, I hope uh, Bo is in a list of seven or eight guys that we're talking about throughout the fall. Gotcha, All right, coach. coach. All right, Coach, we really appreciate your time. We're looking forward to uh, covering the team this spring and into the 2021 season. And uh, thanks for listening to the Inside Carolina podcast. Thank thanks, you. Coach. Appreciate it. Welcome back to the Inside Carolina podcast, special podcast, part two, as promised. Phil Longo's interview you just listened to. I hope you did. If you skipped right to us, um, you might want to check out the subject matter of this podcast. I know um, a lot of you guys like to hear Buck and Greg and Jason talk, but Phil Longo had a lot of good things to say. And I'll start this one the same way I started the first one with Jay Bateman. And I have to mention Johnny T-shirt and johnnytshirt.com first. Uh, 
don't forget them. Buck, Longo, man. Uh, I mean, if you're an offensive coordinator, and I know job opportunities come up elsewhere, but you sit back and you think, I got this guy named Sam Howe as my quarterback. Longo has one of has to have one of the best jobs in the country coming into this spring ball. Am I right? You're right, and I don't think Longo will interview for any positions unless it's a Power Five uh, head coaching position um, before he leaves North Carolina. I, I just don't think he's interested in anything else. But we started out the review of the Bateman uh, interview by talking about how giddy he was and, you know, how excited he was and noting that that's sort of part of Bateman's personality. Longo, not so much, but even if, if you watch that interview or listen to it, uh, Longo sounds like a guy that's got to draw one card to fill a flush. Um, you know, it, he, he knows what he's got in Sam Howe. He knows what he's got in his wide receivers. He talked about them extensively. Um, you know, I, there's plenty of talent there. Coffee Brown. Bo Corrales, Emory Simmons, Josh Downs, and other guys we haven't even really seen too much yet. I think there's plenty of wide receiver talent to give Sam Howell every opportunity in the world to compete for the Heisman. At the same time, I, I don't think he's discouraged at all about what he has at running back. I think he feels fairly confident about that. But before we move on to anything else, I think the thing he's probably most excited about is the trenches. Uh, he's, he's excited about that offensive line and said early on that for the first time ever, they think they may have nine guys that can see the field and not worry too much about drop off. And so we talked about how Bateman felt about the defensive line. I think Longo feels similarly about the offensive line going into uh, 2021 and being strong in the trenches. That's Jason Staples uh, top arguing point there for get through a season without getting knocked off by an underdog. Jason, I'll keep it the same schedule as the last show and we'll stay here with the offensive line. I feel like with offense though, you can smoke and mirror it. Um, to have some success, but when you need to run the ball to win games that Carolina was able to do, of course, those, those running backs, those guys were pretty good last year, uh, I think. But this is where this offensive line, I think, will – I felt like Williams and Carter last year did a lot on their own. They had help. Line was decent, but they did a lot on their own. I think this year is the, is the time that the line carries the running backs for a change in North Carolina. What do you think? Well, they need to. I mean, it's not that there's no talent at running back, but I mean, you said you said it. I mean, those two backs are as good as you're going to have <laughs> as a pair. Uh, and actually, I mean, I, I've, I've been watching with some interest as NFL draft uh, folks are starting to discover Javante Williams. And, uh, and I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here going, yeah, well, you know, if you're an Inside Carolina subscriber, we were we were on Javante as a as a top. NFL prospect before anybody else was because that guy was <laughs> really, really good. But at the same point, that that offensive line has a lot of talent. So it's not that, you know, oh, now the line's going to need to carry the, the backs. Yeah, they're going to need to because you, you're, you don't have a Javante Williams walking through that door. But you got some good, you got some good quality there. But the, but the offensive line has some guys that are that are potential NFL players. There's some guys that can play on Sundays on that offensive line. And it's just a matter now of converting that talent, the capacity that's there, that's the flashes that have been shown where there've been times where they've dominated some really good players and really good defensive lines. And then there've been times where they got their butts kicked a little bit and you can that level of inconsistency that comes usually when you're younger and when you know there's other other elements in play it's fisher cut bait time for a couple of these guys who can really who could really become high or you know middle round draft picks to to do to finish that that job to finish the work and 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 actually become that 
I'm looking forward to seeing really, and, and you know, we just uh, had an article on Hess and what they're doing in the off season. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they're able to do with this group with a full off season, which they did not really get with that group last year. And I felt like the biggest problem for the offensive line last year was in addition to a little bit of uh, discontinuity due to some injury and some, you know, guys uh, not, not always being in the, in the roster or on the roster available. But uh, the biggest problem was that you had a couple of those guys that I thought were 10 or 15 pounds out of, overweight and a little out of shape. And if a couple of those guys can drop about 10 pounds, then you're looking at one of the best offensive lines in the country, in my opinion, just in terms of the talent that's out there. Uh, you know, Notre Dame had one of the two or three best offensive lines in the country last year. Texas A&M had one of the best, both teams Carolina played, and then Alabama. Those teams all lost a bunch of guys. North Carolina's line for going into next year has comparable talent to what those, those guys, those, those programs had last year. But North Carolina's guys are going to be older. The question is, can they discipline themselves in terms of diet, in terms of the weight room, to actually be in peak fighting shape going into 2021. If they can, I think, I think that offensive line will be able to really carry those, those, uh, those running backs quite a ways. Greg, you had a follow there. I'll say that Notre Dame, you know, I talked about, I didn't think Notre Dame's uh, overly showed how they destroyed Carolina late, like Texas A&M did, but that Notre Dame offensive line, if Jason wants to put that comparison out there, then this bunch can be special. Yeah, and I, th I think that's the next step for this offensive line, and that's the next step for this offense you know, in terms of evolving. Um, while when you've got guys like Michael Carter and Javante Williams who could do so much, you can get a little bit creative in how you, how you run your schemes. And there's not a lot of, I don't want to say, there's not a lot of challenges for the offensive line, but it's, it's relatively simple. I mean, you run some powers, typical zone blocking schemes, and you're good to go. I think we're going to see a, a shift from that because when you when you lose guys like Javante and Michael Carter, I mean, again, no knock on who North Carolina has, um, but there's going to be, I think there has to be a change in how Phil Longo kind of utilizes the run game. And that starts with the offensive line with some more conventional run plays. Um, I, I know one thing that Mac Brown harped on last year, um, and you, you didn't see it a lot, but you did see it in some of those games. When you've got third and two and you've got Javante Williams, eh, you really don't need to be passing the ball. Like you kind of get, you have to get back to the point where you can say, all right, we're going to be creative. We're going to use the, the RPO quite a bit. However, on this particular play, we need two yards. We're going to get two yards and there's nothing you can do about it. And I think North Carolina football has gotten away from that uh, dating back to when Larry Fedora came. Um, and you know, we can call it gimmicks, whatever. I know that that gets that riles buck up a little bit. Um, but it's, I think Tommy has used uh, the phrase cuteness. Um, but soft. to be soft, there we go. Let's keep coming <laughs> with it. Uh, but you know, the ability to line up and say, we're going to pick up two yards, whether you want us to or not, has been lacking at times. Um, and I think with this offensive line, uh, for all the reasons that Jason just pointed out, if you don't have elite talents at tailback, you can move the line two yards and have somebody kind of falling behind. Um, and that's where this offense needs to take the next step. And that's why I think we're going to see a little bit of change in how the running backs are utilized, specifically because the offensive line should take that big next step. Yeah, and I think Ty Chandler and Caleb Hood and whoever else is back there are going to be good. They, you know, Longo mentioned British Brooks as a leader and all that. I don't know if he's a guy that's going to be – the thing, but Jason, one thing about the Orange Bowl, I felt like a lot of times last year, Longo's scheme left at least one guy unblocked, and they never really had to worry about that guy making the tackle because Javante broke 75 tackles, Michael Carter broke however many tackles. In the Orange Bowl, the difference was that guy made the tackle. That's what I noticed the most when you lose Carter and Williams, and that's why I think the offensive line this year has to be better. Yeah, that's one of the things that that we actually broke down on the uh, uh, after the Orange Bowl was looking at a couple plays where, honestly, if Carter or Williams are in there, 
they probably score and Carolina probably wins that game because they, you know, they're, as you said, they're one-on-one second level and that guy made the tackle and there was, you know, no broken tackle, no eluding the tackle. And it was one of those where it's exactly the same amount of space, exactly the one-on-one that was set up, but then it doesn't turn into the big play like it did with the, with the guys that they'd had. And that's, that's, that's something that that's not unique to, to Longo. I mean, that's, that's what you try to do as an offensive coordinator is you're always trying to scheme it up so that uh, the, the way that uh, one of the, one of the coaches that I coached under uh, at the high school level was a, was a running back, a very good college running back. And he used to tell his running backs, this is where you earn, this is where you earn your scholarship. This is where you earn your carries. You know, if you want to play at the next level, this is what you have to do. You know, you, you have to earn it with that. There's going to be one guy. It's going to be yours. And that's what every offensive coordinator is. What every offense does is, you know, that the running back has that guy. And if he can't beat that guy, then, well, you're not, you're not going to win as many games, but the thing that they're going to be able to do this year, and this is something I, I said, you know, I, I pointed out that last year we were ahead of everybody in saying Javante is going to be <laughs> NFL scouts are going to love this guy when they get a chance to look closer at his tape, the guy that you're going to see blow up. I mean, obviously Sam Howell is going to be, you know, on every NFL radar, the guy that you're going to see blow up next year going into the process that, that you're going to see everybody talking about is a Zudu. That guy is super talented and you could see him go off the, off the, the draft board really high. If he's able to come in 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 good shape, healthy, stay through the full year, you know, healthy and play at the level that he can. You're talking about a guy that, that is going to be very highly valued at the next level. And you can build around that because you've got that, that level of talent on the interior there that can move around too. If somebody else goes, goes out, Azudu gives them a lot up front. And, and he's a guy I'm really excited to see come back next year. And I, I also think McKeithen has some, some interesting stuff to, to look at for the next level as a guy that if he drops 15 pounds suddenly is on a lot of NFL draft boards as well. Yeah, we'll be talking during spring practice. Who's uh, six, seven, and eight? And like the cornerback deal on the other podcast, if we're talking about that, then that means you got five or six guys that are really good. Um, let's let's push it out further from the ball. Buck Sanders gets you back in here. Um, Josh Downs is a guy that played himself into some hype in the Orange Bowl. I, I think he's going to be one of the leaders, but. Longo really likes Bo Corrales, and when I go back and I look at that Florida State game or I look at other games, Georgia Tech game, I believe he had a touchdown or two. I think Corrales and Downs, that's going to be a heck of a pairing for Sam Howell as as safety nets, really. I think Bo Corrales is a safety net. I think Josh Downs is going to be a given. But the wide receivers lose a ton. I don't think they miss a beat. I'm with you there, and I would throw two other guys into the mix very quickly, one being Garrett Walston, who I think is another safety net kind of guy, red zone guy, uh, somebody that can be effective in the middle of the field down the seam. But Coffee Brown, uh, you know, in, in the past uh, times we've talked about wide receivers, we've always talked about you got to have at least one guy they could take the top off the defense. Well, Coffee Brown and Josh Downs both can do that. Um, both of them are fast enough that uh, opposing defenses are not going to be able to uh, do some of the things they'd like to do in terms of what they do with their safeties. They're going to have to back them up a little bit uh, to prevent that uh, home run ball that Sam Hall- Howell has been known to be able to throw. So, um, those four guys, uh, and I throw Emory Simmons into the mix, uh, that catch he had in the end zone where he mossed the guy, um, that was pretty impressive. I, that's why the wide receiver core doesn't bother me. Uh, yeah, love Diami Brown, love Daz Newsom, but they're bringing by, back guys that have already seen the field. They've already caught touchdown passes that they've already done the things that they need to do to be a very effective offense. And the other thing is combine that with an offensive line that should be able to pass protect better and the inability of, uh, opposing offenses to just, uh, focus on the wide receivers. 
you know, I, I think Sam Howell could have a great year. If opposing defensives decide they, well, we're going to stack the box just to make sure that North Carolina can't run the ball. Sam Howell will win the Heisman. I mean, he's got enough. He's got, this is his third year and he's got all those weapons on the offense that he can go to and other guys that we probably haven't had as much opportunity to see as we're going to have in 2021. So, but you're right. I, I do like Bo Corrales for one reason is he likes to bully guys that try to tackle him. He smacks them. He jumps over them. He puts a shoulder into them and he keeps on trucking and uh, that's what makes him one of my favorites on, uh, receivers is because just like we were talking about with Javante Williams last year, people that defend Bo Corrales are going to be making business decisions after he catches the ball because of how physical he is. Yeah. He's got to stay healthy. And, and if he does that, I agree with everything you said. And it's funny how we full disclosure, we side chat during these and it feels like we're all on the same plane because he's my breakout player of the year candidate if yep. he's healthy yeah and to jason's point on the side chat is that blocking he he nobody talks about the wide receiver blocking um anymore when you have a great running back those guys have, are huge especially in carolina's scheme greg let me let me ask you this um, and Jason mentioned, and it, it's a play that he, I don't think he'll ever forget, but Trifrey Brown's drop in the Orange Bowl. I mean, that's the difference in maybe Carolina winning and losing. I don't know if it's that simple. Um, but that's not unlike his brother and Daz had issues um, in 18 and 19. Uh, I mean, do we see a big leap in that regard for guys like Brown? And I mean, Emory Simmons was pretty solid last year. I mean, who else is there that's going to take a step besides Corrales in your mind? Well, I think. You know, Joffrey Brown, those plays happen. And if you look at what's happened since Lonnie Galloway and Mac has been here, uh, the drop issue has, has been corrected. And it's always going to be somewhat of an issue that you have to harp on. That was just a bad play for, for Joffrey, and you hate it for him. Uh, but I really like the mix of this wide receiver group um, in that you've got a burner in Joffrey. You've got a technician in Emory Simmons who can do a lot of different things. Josh Downs is really your slot guy. Um, Bo Corrales is a guy who I think can do everything. He's got good speed, um, good size. So you like him in, in the red zone. Uh, you like him on, on some deep routes just because he can get up over people. Um, a different type of player than Mac, Mac Hollins, of course, but kind of the same build. Um, and I think maybe a little bit more physical than Mac, maybe a little bit better route runner, but doesn't have the speed, of course. Uh, so I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of good pieces just in those core components. And then, as Buck said, when you add in Garrett Walston, um, and then let's see here, I'm looking at the list of, of wide receivers. I mean, Antoine Green is, is a guy that we've talked about so much over the years. Um, has he been given all the chances that he's going to be given? Toughness. Because, yeah. I mean, at some point, Mac Brown's not a guy that's going to say, look, I'm going to keep giving you opportunities, and you're going to keep disappointing me. Uh, we're going to keep going with it. That's not how Mac works. It's like, these are your chances. Um, at some point, you're going to have to cut bait. And uh, I think, you know, Green, this is an important offseason for him because I think he has all the pieces. And Jason's been high on him for a long time in terms of potential. But as Jason said, you, you, got, you got to have the toughness. And if he can, I mean, wow, what, a, what an incredible extra piece to add to the mix. Yeah, he's as talented as anybody on this on this roster at the receiver position. And I mean, it's a talented roster. It for him, it really does come down to toughness and want to. And and you know, it's not even hands. I mean, he's got the hands. He's got he's had some tools. injury issues too, hasn't he, Jason? Yeah, yeah he but, a but some of that injury. some of that comes back to toughness, though, because I mean, I hate to say it this way, but there are everybody after week two or three, who's played any significant stuff has, has some injuries. Everybody's dinged up. Now he had a serious one, no doubt. And this year might be, you know, he may have needed a year to really recover from that. Uh, because I mean, it was a, it was a bad, a bad deal, but at a certain point, once you've actually gotten healthy, you have to learn to trust it and you have to, you know, yeah, it aches or it hurts or, you know, yeah, I'm dinged in this way or that you've got to be willing to push through when it's when, 
when you're ready, when they're willing to let you play, when the, when the medical people say you're healthy enough to play and you're like, ah, it just doesn't feel right. You know, that sort of thing. You've got to be the guy who is pushing to be on the field. Who's pushing like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm going to play. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this aches or this hurts or, you know, whatever. That's the difference. And, and so I'm not talking about pushing through once you're actually legitimately injured. I'm, you know, don't play on a broken leg, but you Jaylen have Waddle. to be what's that Jalen Waddle. Yeah. Well, Jalen Waddle. Yeah. There are guys who've done it, but, <laughs> but the, the point is that with him, you've got to, you've got to have that toughness to be able when you're not a hundred percent, when you are dinged up a little bit and all that to really play and fight like you're healthy and that's one of the things that separates guys at the next level. Cause the NFL, you, you know, guys live in the training room and you've got to be that guy. And so far he hasn't shown that he has that level of drive and want to, but I've seen it happen before where suddenly the switch gets flipped and a guy, you know, just the right mixture of healthy of, of health and, and the, the motivation switch getting flicked happens. And all of a sudden all that talent manifests and man, he, he you talk about him hitting his ceiling and that that raises the that raises the ceiling of the of the of the group as a whole big time. But I, I think Chaffray really needs to be the the other guy. I mean, I think he you're you're counting on Chaffray to be the, the guy that stretches the defense and, and and makes those big catches. You can't really count on 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 Antoine at this point as much. He's he's bonus. If you get yeah. both of those guys that meet the, that start living up to their potential on that, the ceiling is the roof for this offense. Yeah, and I and and the reason we haven't talked about running backs is because we don't know. I, I mean, we know what was on the Orange Bowl field. Um, I don't think we see those guys on the field much. Ty Chandler, his tapes out there from Tennessee and the SEC games, and the young guys, we just don't know. I, I mean, there's I don't think there's much because right now, if we talk about them, we're just speculating and guessing, quite frankly. So we'll certainly get into the running back issues and the running back situation during spring brawl as we know more. I'm going to close the deal talking about Sam Howell. Um, and Buck, I think you asked the question, or maybe it was Ross, and I'll let Jason pontificate, and then I'm going to let Buck and Greg close the show. I think Ross maybe asked, what can Sam Howell do to be better? And Longo talked about some cleaning up of the footwork, especially late in the season, and also throws to his left. I found that interesting. Um, it makes me want to go back and like watch tape, and I'm not a tape guy. But what that's is a that... hobby horse of, of Longo, by the way. Just you're going to hear that from Longo about almost any quarterback he coaches. Just for the record, throws left, clean up footwork. What does Sam Howe, in your mind, Jason, in a nutshell, have to do to be better this season? To me, it's a matter of recognizing pressure just a little quicker and getting the ball out quicker. Uh, and, and so essentially when, when a team, and it's not always on the, against the blitz, it's when you start to feel or recognize pressure immediately understanding where your outlet is. And I think he understands it, but there are times where he sticks with things too long and he doesn't get the ball out quickly enough. And that, that the cost of that can be pretty high the main thing you've got to focus on at that point as, as a quarterback, when you're starting to get pressure is first do no harm. And the first thing you can, the main thing you need to do in those contexts is get the ball out to the right person as quickly as you can. And there were times this year where I still felt like, I mean, it was, it was leaps and bounds better than, than freshman year, but I still felt like there were some places where he could really improve on that. And I think Longo's right to the left in particular, when, when, when that guy, when the outlet was to the left, that's when he, he struggled the most. But uh, overall, I think that's where, if he improves on that, the, the biggest question mark in his game at this, at this stage is really, is really closed. 71 sacks his first two years, yeah. Tommy. I'd be interested to know how many of those are on him because I'd bet half of them. Or close at to least it. 30 based on, based yeah. on the, the, the tape I've watched, I'd say out of the, you said 71? 71. Yeah, I'd say at least 30 of those. Yeah, because he holds the ball way too long. And there's been plenty of times, like to your point, Jason, that the, the outlet's right there wide open. You know, it's to your left wide open, and and he missed them sometimes. It's tough to nitpick because it is a nitpick, but maybe it makes the difference in a game or two. Buck, I'll let you close this one just like you did in the defensive Bateman roundtable. Um, is this Carolina offense prepared to take – 
the next step, whatever that step may be, because damn, they were good last year. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't care about a next step. Just give me the step they had last year, and I'll be happy. <laughs> Just slide step into twenty twenty. that with an, we pair that with an improved defense, and all of a sudden you're talking about a whole different ball game. Uh, for whatever reason, and I was thinking about the best little whorehouse in Texas, <laughs> you know, and take a little sidestep there. Um, I guarantee you nobody on podcast world has referenced that movie on a football podcast. It's a, it's, it's a legitimate title though, right? Isn't that what they called it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, that's the name of a movie. Yeah. I mean, uh, so – uh, take a little sidestep, you know, in, uh, 2021 for the offense is, is just fine with me. Um, and, and I, I think probably the thing about Sam Howell, I think we'll see, uh, some changes in how they do offense in general. Um, you know, that they have lived and died by the RPO for the last two years. I think you may see a little retraction uh, in the RPO, uh, world, not a great one, not a tremendous one because it's worked out really good for them. But I, I think on some of those third down and two calls, like, uh, Greg referenced, it's not going to be an RPO. It's going to be Sam hand the damn ball to somebody here. And, and we're going to block it this way. And, uh, because you're a quarterback and you got a run pass option and, you're going to throw the ball because you're a quarterback and that's what you want to do. Uh, so I think we'll see some changes there, uh, in terms of you know, just having set plays. I think there will be more of an emphasis on take what the defense gives you rather than looking for the home run ball every time. Uh, but I'm fine. If Sam looks for the home run ball every time, I love seeing those, uh, you know, 75 yard catches, uh, by Josh Downs in the uh, Orange Bowl, where he's ten yards past everybody else. If you got it blocked up right, yeah, I mean, uh, I they're going to tweak it some. They're going to do things maybe a little bit different, but I don't see a dramatic difference. Uh, I just think it's going to all depend on whether they can find a for real legitimate option uh, or a couple of them at running back that can fill out the. Uh, that four heart flush that, uh, Phil Longo looks like he's got in his back pocket. Indeed. I, I think you're right on there. And of course we'll talk about it a plenty during spring brawl. It'll be interesting to see which running back step up. I think we've nailed it on the lines and across the defense and all that, and whoever the fourth corner is from our last podcast. And I'll be interested to see what ride receivers step up, but I think everybody um, and what a change it is. Everybody will be watching who Carolina's running backs are heading into the fall after spring ball. Greg Barnes, Jason Staples, and Buck Sanders has always been a pleasure, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, look forward to talking a lot more football here in the next month or two. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Tommy. Yep, thanks, Tommy. Yep. And we know you got to run, buddy, so uh, get on your hobby horse and ride. Yep, I'll ride it out. Appreciate it. Shop Johnny T-shirt, johnnytshirt.com, and rate us and review mm. us. Thanks, boys.